Hello and welcome to Wholesale Change. My name is Ian Heller. I'll be your co-host today for this webcast and podcast from Distribution Strategy Group. Working with me today, as usual, is my fabulous co-host. He's the Wayne Gretzky of data because he doesn't just use data to tell you where your company is, but to tell you where your company is going. You like that one, Jonathan? I think you really pucked that up pretty well. <laughs> it's, it's well, you know, data sometimes is described as a hockey stick. Uh, oh, I get it. Yep, there's all kinds of hockey analogies here. I know. And of course, there's the famous "I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out." Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. And I, you know, after all that, I forgot to introduce you, Jonathan Bine, PhD, my business partner, the love of my business life. And well, on the love of my business life, but Ian, I'm feeling a little distance between us right now because you are coming to us from Raleigh, North Carolina. I am. I am. I've been working on my Southern accent. I had breakfast this morning. They offered me grits, which I turned down, even though I like them. I had a bowl of fruit. Do, but uh, do grits have wheat? I should no, know. No, they don't. But they're they have a lot of carbs, and you know, I'm trying to Got it. just to be different from everyone else. My New Year's resolution is to get in shape and lose weight. Makes you absolutely unique. As if you weren't already. Okay. I know. Well, we have a great guest this morning. We're going to introduce him in a couple of minutes. It's Eric Chernick, who's the CEO of Building Controls and Solutions. But we got to do a little bit of business first so that we can uh, pay the bills here. Uh, but first, we're going, to we're going to talk about a new product that we have. Jonathan, you want to take a minute to talk about CXRX? You bet. I'm going to put up a slide here. Yep. So we have a new offering called... CXRX that stands for the customer experience prescription. And many of you are dealing with issues with customer experience right now, trying to improve customer experience. We've got an approach that not only measures, but provides actionable information to systematically improve your customer experience and your customer satisfaction. And of course, as we know, Good customer experience drives loyalty, and loyal customers drive revenue and profitability. So what's, I think, important about this is that if you're using something like NPS, you'll, you'll know that it doesn't give you the guidance on what to do. It tells you where you stand, but it doesn't give you the guidance on what to do. And our approach uh, definitely gets that information and, and allows you to say, hey, Houston, we got a problem. Phoenix, you're in good shape, and to isolate what those problems are. So if you're interested in learning more about CXRX, reach out to me. My contact information is at the going to be at the end of the show. Fantastic. It's an exciting product that Jonathan developed. And we're, we're, we're really thrilled with it. Uh, but we're also thrilled to have White Cup as a sponsor, White Cup Solutions. And uh, as White Cup likes to say, distributors are facing challenges in an economy of inflation and supply chain disruption. But there's a lot that can be solved by understanding your customers. White Cup CRM and BI, or business intelligence, provides data that allows distributors to lay internal groundwork, clear billing, improve customer trust and partnerships, and increases sales responsiveness in a robust and accessible platform for your team. Become a leader in the distribution space by understanding industry trends and provide guidance to build trust and transparency and customer relationships and more. Integrate your ERP, empower your sales team, and gain market advantage with White Cup CRM, BI, and pricing products specifically tailored to the distribution industry. Offer more value to your customers by going to whitecupsolutions.com today and request a demo to learn more. I had a demo recently. It's very impressive software. I recommend you take a look at it. This is a company on the move. It is. I mean, they are they are they are definitely a company on the move. They're thriving and growing fast. Another company on the move is Infor. We are delighted to welcome Infor as a new sponsor to Distribution Strategy Group's content. Infor is a global leader in business cloud software specialized by industry. They develop complete solutions for their focus industries, including distribution, industrial manufacturing, food and beverage, retail, and more. Infor's mission critical enterprise applications and services are designed to deliver sustainable operational advantages with security and faster time to value. Their modern ERP and WMS solutions have distribution industry functionality built in, and they make it easier for you to offer new value-added services 
elevate the customer experience, and achieve operational excellence. They're obsessed with delivering successful business outcomes for customers and are continually innovating to quickly solve emerging business and industry challenges. Over 65,000 organizations in more than 175 countries, from Fortune 5 enterprises to SMBs, small and mid-sized businesses, rely on Infor 17,000 employees and their deep industry expertise to help overcome market disruptions and achieve their business goals. Visit www.infor.com slash distribution to learn more. So thanks to White Cup. Thanks to Infor for sponsoring today's content. That's what makes makes it possible for us to bring this to you. Otherwise, we we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to do it. And now we are delighted to welcome to the show Mr. Eric Chernick, who's the CEO of Building Controls and Solutions, and someone I've known for a long, long time. Eric, you and I worked together at Granger. I left Granger 24, almost 25 years ago now. And we knew each other then when you were just a uh, uh, a young, uh, uh, what was it, an MBA, what we call that, the MBA rotational program. Is that what you were in? Yeah, leadership development program. That's right. Yeah. Leadership development program. That's right. And uh, look where you've come, my friend. You, you, are, you have uh, had a great career. Why don't you kind of walk us through your career? Yeah, we have, you know, some, some uh, synopsis on the sure. slide here, but tell us how you got to where you are. Sure. Happy to, Ian. Um, I'd probably break my background into maybe a few chapters. The first chapter, it's not even on the, on the page here, is I started in studying organizational behavior and human resource consulting, all about figuring out how do you motivate people, how do you organize work. Um, I was a consultant to companies like Disney, Starbucks, Apple Computer. Um, great foundation for me, all about people, which is what our business is about. My next chapter, I went back to business school to learn about marketing and finance and strategy, um, uh, supply chain. And that launched me to jumping into Granger, where we met Ian, into the leadership development program. And I learned my, I learned how to some skills around general management from spending time in the field, in the branch operations close to our customers, to getting more strategic around product management, marketing. Um, for a chunk of time, I did something in Granger called market expansion, figuring out how to open up new territories uh, around the United States. So that was chapter, whatever that was, two or three. My next chapter was a few other companies and general management P&L experiences, which has led me to my current chapter as CEO of Building Controls and Solutions. But I lean on that first chapter, the people chapter, every day of my job. That's really amazing because because when I think Chicago Booth MBA, I think like hardcore quant, right? Um, in contrast to the other one across town, a yep. great school, different emphasis. So it's uh, it's fascinating that you you've gravitated towards the HR people side of things. So that's exactly why I chose uh, Chicago because I wanted to fill that gap, and I was a little on the softer side of business, and I needed to build up my analytic skills as well. Nice. Nice, nice. That's uh, that's quite a that's quite a background. Um, you know, I, I think uh, when we worked together so long ago, it was you know obvious to me that you were going to be a star, and you certainly are. Um, and now you're in this position with building controls and solutions. Can you give us an overview of the company? Maybe the geography, a sense of scale, and the target market you focus on. Sure, sure. So building controls and solutions, we're in a niche industry focused on building automation for commercial buildings. Um, so every, if you think about um, how build, commercial buildings operate in terms of uh, HVAC, lighting, security, how do all of those things connect in uh, the industries like uh, school districts or hospitals or retail malls or office buildings or government buildings? Um, so we operate across all those types of commercial buildings. Um, we help the, the buildings be more effective, more efficient. Um, we're in 14 locations around the United States, uh, 100 and, uh, about 130 employees right now. Okay, good. And, you, and, and, and so you describe this as what a 70 something year old company and a four year old company in one at, at the same time, right? And and 
So I want to I want to hear you jump into that, but first I want to encourage people to ask questions. There is a, uh, a questions uh, button uh, there that you where you can submit uh, some questions to us or use the chat. But sure, I mean if I give you a little quick history on the company, and I did mention to you earlier that yes, we're as old as seventy eight years old, or we're as young as four years old. So quick, um, we were four years ago. We were a small division of a larger industrial company, industrial controls company. We're owned by a private equity firm called Luther King down here in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, it was a sleepy division with three, four locations, 35 employees. Um, and uh, I thought we could do some things around building some organic strategies to grow it, as well as merge with and acquire some other companies. So over the last four years, we've uh, followed that roadmap. We've built, we've acquired five new, lo five new companies. We've greenfield and started up some new branches in different parts of the country. We're now 100, as I mentioned, we went from 35, now we're 130 employees. We went from four locations to 14. You know, the scale of the business is pretty important. The scale yeah. has allowed us to invest in people, invest in technologies like our ERP, like e-commerce, invest in processes, you know, to make us easier to do business with. Uh, we love to share best practices kind of across the company, region to region. Yeah, and so uh, that I mean that's impressive growth, right? So you're you're you know you have a double digit number of locations now. You've got a triple digit number of employees. You've got you know I think we were talking before the show, so that means you're at the point where you're creating your own IT architecture rather than outsourcing it. You got a human resources leader rather than outsourcing it. So uh, can you briefly tell us you know how do you make that decision and, I, and you know this is a new question for you so sorry to throw this on you but how do you uh make the decision to bring some of those things in-house versus continue to rely on outsourcing well when we when we started and um started the business my first plan from a leadership perspective was to find a really good financial leader so our cfo yeah our cfo and you know umbrellaed over it and accounting and purchasing um, because of my background, I umbrellaed over marketing and human resources. Yeah. And so as we've been building our kind of roadmap to scale, we've now figured out where we can, the inflection points between outsourcing and insourcing. And we still outsource a bunch. We're still a relatively small company. Um, uh, we might be big in our space, but 130 people is not a, a size of Granger, certainly. Um, so we're relying on consultants where we need to. Um, we're relying on experts around maybe benefits and payroll that we don't need to bring in-house on the HR side. But now our HR team, our HR leader alongside me is going to be really focused on employee development, for example, um, performance management, um, those kinds of things, more strategic. So I'm just thinking back, Eric, to when you... Your 70 year old company or 67 year at that point was acquired by Luther King. And you are effectively a startup in a sense, in terms of the way you're operating. I mean, what, what you're describing, I mean this in the positive sense. It's 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 very entrepreneurial. And it sounds like it's probably a little bit on the smaller side of what a, a PE fund would do. Is is that a fair statement? It probably is, yes. Um, we probably were a little starter and smaller. We were a, di a division of a bigger company. So the PE company was trying to figure out four years ago, do we sell it? Do we um, close it down, this little division, or do we invest in it? And the more I spent time consulting at first, um, I realized there's a gem in this business. And if only we invested in our people, our processes, our technologies, we could grow it up into something special. And we right now are one of the larger players in our industry right now and still growing. So let's let's talk about this because as we were preparing for the show, one of the things that we talked about is that your business has got a very highly value added component. So when you talk about what makes you special, talk to us about your value proposition, talk to us about the business model, talk to us about how that differs perhaps from, from other approaches for building controls. Sure, it's, it's, it's interesting. This is the fun part of my job is figuring out how do we make our company special and how do we lean on um you know things that were started many years ago so a distributor is buying and selling products buying products from manufacturers selling them to customers how they do that can be very different um i'm a big believer in figuring out what the value add is and the competitive advantage of of me as a distributor 
Um, one, you know, I'll, I'll lean on a few things. One is we are we try to be local. Local that means in terms of people, expertise, inventory for our customers. Some customers need products same day or next day. They can't wait for next week. And so there's some stocking component, but there's also the consultative element of our people in the branches, on the phones, um, in terms of providing consultative advice to what the project's gonna look like, what's the challenge they're facing. So it's not just that the customer comes in with a list of five things and they know exactly what they need. Um, we might help them think about that project that's gonna help them with efficiency and effectiveness. I will say our other val big value add is our technical expertise. So think about bu um, um, building automation and uh, control or controls to, to drive HVAC lighting security. Um, there's a technical engineering component. Uh -huh. um, so we're working with mechanical mm -hmm. contractors and we need people that can advise mechanical or controls contractors. So we have some very highly skilled technicians that support, that train. So training is an interesting thing. Why doesn't the why doesn't the customer train themselves? Well, they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the technical knowledge. So we provide, we get trained up with the manufacturers and you know various certifications so that we can help our customers, <clears throat> bring in a batch of customers, train them, and really help lift our contractors <clears throat> to be better in front of the end user. Um, I'll say our people are our are, are, are secret sauce. <laughs> Manufacturers are starting to see, see the value that BCS, Building Controls and Solutions, brings to the contractor, the end user. So more and more vendors or manufacturers are asking us to take on more territories. Customers are starting to trust us more as we advise them or partner with their business. Uh, it's really a lot of fun. Our tagline is smart choices for smart buildings. Oh, I love that. So let's talk about this smart thing for a second. So in, in the mechanical contractor world, I'm, I'm imagining that there is a traditional mechanical contractor who is not a target for your business, but then there's a subset of mechanical contractors who have this more advanced expertise. If you could talk to me about how that segments out and um, maybe more of the, the value add for that, for that group that is focused on the building controls. Yeah, so end users, um, if they're large, they might have their own mechanical contractors in st on staff. If they're mm -hmm. medium and smaller buildings, so four stories and smaller, they might rely on a mechanical contractor to advise them on a whole bunch of things from ventilation to uh, automation of, of different product, automation of different uh, parts of their building and so forth. Now, some mechanical contractors will get very specialized and have a controls department within the mechanical contractor umbrella. And so we might be consulting, selling into the con controls contractors. They might not need as much training. The mechanical contractors without the control division might need some more help and consultation. Okay, so in some cases, you're helping these contractors transition into a little bit of a new business, is that? Yes, as they're, yeah. as they're growing up and they're building, we're helping them be stronger so they can be better in front of their end user. We're yeah. not trying to, to compete with them, we're trying to arm them with information and, and technology and products. Very interesting. We might go on a job walk with the uh, contractor. We might do some what's called takeoffs and CAD drawings and estimating of projects. So it depends whether we're doing build spec work, retrofit work, or maybe service and maintenance. Service and maintenance is gonna be more, um, you know, finding the right products versus the build spec. We're building into a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar project, you know, around controls. Yeah, you know, I think generally speaking, distributors or some distributors undervalue how important it is for your people to have good product knowledge. That you know the. And having done some research around this, and I mean, I remember doing a focus group where we asked, you know, hey, all things being equal, uh, will you go to the distributor that has more knowledgeable people when it comes to products in this one the different industry? But the answer probably applies in yours too. And the, the customer said 100%, absolutely, yes. I want to talk to someone who knows the, who knows products. And it's such a differentiator. I mean, 
you talk about value-added services. I mean, you can't even make a phone call to Amazon to, I mean, that's not their value prop, but they don't even pretend to know anything about, you know, products. And in a field like yours, where I assume the technology is advancing very quickly, it must be hard for you guys to stay up to speed, but it's even harder for the contractors, I would imagine. Uh, it is. It is. And, you know, that's why, you know, in this niche industry, it allows us to focus on and be careful we don't get too broad, you know, and broadline. There's there's a place for broadline distributors like a Granger or a Home Depot or MSC, certainly. But in our niche industry, we're able to stay very focused and bring in technical people, train our people. Um, skills, skills development is really, really important as we certify our own individuals to be trained, almost train the trainers for yeah. our manufacturers. So in many cases, some of our folks might be more knowledgeable than the manufacturer sales rep. You know, um, we have a number of manufacturers we work with, Honeywell, Johnson Controls, Belimo, and others that um, they rely on us to train the customer right. and to really sell and grow market share for their products. It's interesting. I just did a little search in, in Hoover's number of mechanical contractors in the U.S. is like 300,000. Then I put in the keyword automation and the keyword controls. And there were about 17,000 of that 300,000 that had the keyword automation or control. So I'm guessing that's those, those folks are your target. I would say both, Jonathan, the 300,000 yeah. is and also the 17,000. Um, okay. They really both are. Hmm. Um, and in many cases, if you even want to take it upstream, the consulting engineers that are um, specking products into buildings is also our target audience. It might be a long sell cycle, 12 mm -hmm. months, 18 months, two years, but we're building demand for our manufacturers and for BCS. So are you calling on specifying engineers? We are to some extent, yes. Um, yep, it's part of our value, value chain of our kind of sales process. All right. And, and, you know, what was the catalyst that drew you to this particular position, Eric? I mean, based on your background, you had a lot of choices and this is the one you, cho you chose. And so, I mean, it sounds exciting, but, uh, you know, was it the fact that it's sort of the building off of a platform, an established platform, but an entrepreneurial culture, the challenge of starting from scratch, the industry, the markets, the people, what drew you to this particular position? What was the catalyst? So I've always been agnostic to industry. And Ian, I don't know if you remember me from the early days when we were working together and I was learning marketing from you and your counterparty peers. I'm a, I'm a growth guy. I, I get energy and excited about growth. And so if somebody tells me they want to invest in growth, which Luther King did, I get very excited. And growth to me means you know, expanding uh, territories, expanding product and service offerings expanding channels to market, um, you, know, at, you know, it could be acquisitive, in addition to organic. So those, all those growth things, if somebody tells me we have a checkbook to, um, to help you drive growth, Eric, um, that probably, that's probably what drew me in four years ago, that opportunity to grow something and build a, build a great team uh, around, you know, around growth. It's been interesting as we've uh, as we've uh, uh, merged with or acquired other companies. Yeah. Um, the question always comes up as to well, how do you how do you build how do you build your build a team? Yeah. And I would say the customer facing and technical side, we've mostly inherited because we've bought companies and merged with companies because of their people. Right. We didn't buy it because of a intellectual property license. We bought it because of the people. Right. And I want to mean I want to figure out. I want to learn from those individuals, those experts, and then hopefully figure out what their best practice are, practices are that we can take to other people in our business, okay, in another region or another vertical segment and so forth. So right. customer facing and technical is, was built homegrown. The back office is more, I, can, I got to find out where do we outsource, what do we insource, where do I find talent to bring into our back office, whether that's marketing, supply chain, IT, HR, finance. Now, we don't even call ourselves, um, this is also part of our culture, we don't call ourselves headquarters. Our back office is called the FSO. FSO stands for Field Support Office. 
I love that. We're all about figuring out how do we help our field support their customer. Um, you know, recently we had a co we had a contest where we asked our employees to think about a tagline, you know, for our business, you know, for internally for our business. And and the winner of the we had 80 out of, you know, at the time 100, 110 people participate in the contest. And the winner was powered by people, driven by innovation, guided by integrity. Wow. I love that. Mm. And, and I love the field support notion. You know, the my last executive job, I had a rule for everyone in my department that if anyone from the field called, you had to drop whatever you were doing and answer the phone. And we actually had IT put all the field leaders and customer facing personnel into the into our cell phones in the department. And, you know, it just sends a different message when you view the field as, you know, at the tip of the spear rather than at the bottom of the organization, like they're sometimes described. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and it could be very scary. So think about as we acquired a 10 person company, you know, in um, Charlotte, North Carolina, or a 12 person company in Boston, Massachusetts. What are they thinking? They're thinking, oh, shoot, there's yeah. this big company and a whole bunch of things are going to change. Right. And so what we try to do, and we, I think we've been relatively successful, although I keep working on it, is we initially, you know, we initially are thinking about how do we alleviate fear for the individuals um, that are there? How do we show the team that the local leadership, we're going to empower them to grow the business. We're going to provide more resources to the local team to even do better in front of their customers and offer them more products, services, capabilities maybe take that back office stuff off their plate so they can focus on their customer. Um, we tie them, we, we tie all of our employees uh, into an incentive program that's tied to the business. So we kind of go through a few steps to make sure we don't lose people. Um, and then we're retaining the talent that we tried to acquire and merge with. Right. Over the last few years, we've had five acquisitions. Um, we've had attrition rate of about 4%. Wow. Our turnover has been much lower than some peer companies that have done M&A that are probably more in the 10 to 20 percent range of, yeah. uh, of attrition. So this actually leads to a, a natural next question, Eric, which is how are you managing change across this time of rapid growth in the industry? So with our hyper growth, it is a lot about change management. You know, I mentioned a few things about uh, we're certainly all constantly onboarding new people. So assimilating with our current team members, um, getting people, trying to get people ramped up as quick as possible. Uh, I mentioned kind of alleviating fears and the local empowerment is really important. Um, how we manage our culture is something I spend a lot of my time on. I probably spend 50% of my time thinking about people, process, and culture. Um, our culture is probably, I, I know it's enhanced by um, our transparency and accountability. So I share a lot of information with employees across the company and our FSO does, um, includes results, you know, including results of the business. Some of these small companies never knew their owner may not have ever shared with them the financials and the profitability of the business. We share information. We, um, I, like I said before, we tie incentives or bonus structures to everyone in the business, whether you're an outside seller or whether you're a warehouse person or a customer service person. Um, we look for input inputs and feedback from our employee population. Um, we conduct an annual survey to get a sense. We do our own NPS type uh, survey to understand what our employees are thinking. And the outcomes of the surveys the last couple of years have led to some new actions. It's led to creating a peer recognition program we call above and beyond. It's led to uh, creating a monthly newsletter and an annual and a monthly town hall meeting that I conduct each uh, you know each month to share what's going on in the business. Based on the recent survey, one of the big uh, um, projects or initiatives we have for 2023 is to really build out a more robust skills development program uh, for our for our employees and team members. Um, so that's coming down the pike. Um, so those are some of the things around culture. I probably forgot a few things, but uh, you can hear my, hopefully you hear my passion around yeah. our people and our culture. So, so one thing I love about what you just said, Eric, is I think that culture management stems from the top. 
I've seen companies who view culture as a objective for the HR person to handle, to manage. It becomes like a checklist item. And I think that's really, I think that's really the upside down approach. I think the way you're doing it of starting that tone at the top. We've had other folks on, on this show who have a similar approach and they are also measuring um, the customer, I mean, the employee satisfaction. Some, some are using ENPS, some are using other things. Um, one of the things that we found uh, was with, um, with Randy Eddy from U.S. Electrical Services, Inc., was that his culture measurement, as it went up, or, uh, profitability went up. And they were perfectly correlated, by the way. Yep. So, Yeah, no, it's interesting. when and, uh, you, you hit on a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I do not believe you ever get good customer engagement unless you have employee engagement. And mm -hmm. so all the things we talk about culture is really to drive employee engagement that people love what they do, love coming into work Monday mornings. If there's a customer situation that they have to figure out at you know, 5.30 when they were supposed to go home at five, um, they want to do it because they're part of the business and they love what they do. do. If, they, if that shows to the customers, then I find customers get engaged. I, I kind of think about it as a, our business as a, in a distribution world as a five-legged stool. The first three legs are internal. So our outside sales team, our inside sales and counter team, our technical team, that's kind of three legs of the stool. If those three are in harmony and in sync and, and doing the right thing, that's a hit a double or a triple. The way you hit a home run now is to team up with your outside manufacturer, your vendor, hmm. and start to build a strategic relationship with them so that they're bringing you leads, they're helping you train, you're helping them with ideas to grow the business. That's the fourth leg of the stool is the vendor and working strategically with our manufacturing partners. The fifth leg of the stool, we can't forget this fifth leg, it's the one that pays the bills, it's our customer. And so how do we team up the vendor, our internal team and the customer so that we become that trusted advisor, that partner for the customer? And they want to, you know, the vendor wants to do business with us and the customer wants to do business with us. So I'm imagining a five-leg stool is more stable than a four-leg stool. <laughs> I, I, yes, I, I think so. We want to have raving fans. We want our employees to be raving fans. We want, back to Ian's at the very beginning, talking about NPS, um, we want our customers to be raving fans as far as us as well. It's mm -hmm. not about loyalty for that customer for that, that day, but it's loyalty for the next few years. It's, it's referring us to other customers in the industry, other buildings, whatever it might be. We, we start to become thought leaders too. So as, as part of this, how have, how have you built out your leadership team? Sounds like you've created this amazing environment that's, that's attractive and magnetic. H how have you built out your leadership? What, what, what steps have you taken? Where's that going? So as I mentioned before, our, um, our customer facing side of things um, has, been more has been more homegrown. It's been, we have some in, folks in the industry that have been in, the, uh, folks in the company that have been in the industry for 10, 20, we have one individual 43, 44 years in the, in the industry. He's a guru. And so we have figured out, we've hopefully enabled these longtime talented people with more resources to get excited to work with our customers. You know, our, you know, 44 year veteran out in Salt Lake City, he loves developing business and coming up with ideas focused on our customers. And so I want to figure out how do I get the administrative stuff off his plate so that he can focus on the customers and we can, you know, he can be excited, uh, be passionate about, you know, the business side by side with the customer. So homegrown uh, field support. Hmm. And then we've been looking for, you know, like I mentioned before, the back office FSO, who are some, where can I find best practices um, really good industry benchmark, you know, individuals to help us um, scale up the company so we can be more efficient. So as we're building out some new processes, they might sound simple, like, you know, um, shipping notifications to customers or automating some of our AR and AP processes. Those things then take less time for our field people to have to deal with. Same with technology, same with e-commerce. Um, we're trying to you know, do all these things to enable our customers to do business with us easier. I, don't, I got a little off topic on you, Jonathan. Um, in terms of our people, it's it's finding good people. I, I tend to, certainly on the technical side, I'd probably lean on recruiters. 
On the net left technical, I lean on our network and uh, networking, networking, networking in terms of referrals of really good people. And that's how we found our recent head of marketing, our head of uh, human resources through networking. That's absolutely the best way to build a, a team of any size, if you can. You, you, people are not always in a position to do that. But if you have a good initial set of people, they're going to know other good people and people tend to move in packs. So that makes sense, right? Yep. And all I can do is kind of, you know, share our vision, our excitement about the business, let individuals that are coming into the business get to meet other people to see, is this the right place for them? Are the, is, is, our, is our passion going to, you know, overflow and help them create passion for, you know, for growing the business? I want to push on that a little bit, Eric, because I mean, I understand that when you are looking for the functional leaders, whether it's a CFO or a marketing leader, you definitely want someone who's a subject matter expert. But there's also this culture of the leadership team where, you know, as a team, you know, they are leading the business in terms of expertise. But if you don't have a healthy leadership team culture, you're not going to have a healthy employee culture, right? Yes. So how do you select for people who have the right values and attitudes and team skills. Because, you know, I, I mean, we've all made bad hires and we brought somebody on who we thought was going to be a great team player who turned out to be corrosive to the team. Um, and then even if you get the right people, you have to get them to work together in a way that's healthy, that manages conflict well, because uh, you, you can't avoid the conflict, you're going to have it, but you need to get through it in a healthy way. So when you look at your direct reports, how do you make them a high-powered team as the as the CEO? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, like um, as I'm as we're hiring new people, the best I if I can get really understand the references and not just the references they give me, and not just the forty-five minute interview here and the forty-five minute interview there, but if I can talk to somebody that's worked with that person for three, five, seven years and has seen what their style is, their leadership style, their functional style, their results orientation. That's a really, that's much better than my 45 minute interview um, to understand. And I'm, I'm leaning on my trusted advisors in my network to help me with that. Now for folks that are on my team that are on the tech, more technical and customer facing side, um, how do we bring that together? We meet together as, as a staff um, once a week we, on a monthly basis, we spend a little bit more time uh, digging, into, digging into initiatives and topics. Um, and periodically, we'll have a retreat where we'll get together for you know, a day and a half, two days, and talk about um, you know, initiatives in the business, talk about um, people will come prepared to talk about um, the, you know, parts of the business that they're passionate about. I've tried to facilitate and guide that a little bit yeah. as a CEO but I'm really counting on entrepreneurial thinking coming up from the team. And I'm trying to figure out how to empower them. It's a, it's a tricky balance between too much structure and too little structure. So I'm kind of, uh, I probably lean to the middle of trying to guide a little bit, knowing that we wanna grow exponentially. And we're not happy in single digit growth. We want double digit growth. And right. that might be different than the place they came from before. Yeah, you know, so it's interesting because you are among the least political and you're totally non-manipulative. I mean, I mean, from the first time I met you, you were just this square dealer who uh, communicated clearly and expected to get that back. And as I look at who's on the call today, you know, there's a guy named Brian. Brian, you know who you are. Uh, Ron, you know who you are. They are similar leaders in that they're completely transparent. They're completely straightforward. Um, but we run into those people who are not like that and they are manipulative and they are very, very good at it to the point where when they interview, they represent themselves as not that way. <laughs> Cause that's you know, part of the manipulation is acting like you're not manipulative. Um, so it's, you mentioned that one of the things you do is you find references other than the ones that people give you. Do you just look, you know, do you just network around and, and, and call those people out of the blue? I mean, I think that's a really smart thing to do, but how do you get it done? Well, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have done what I'm doing 20 years ago, Ian. The network takes a while to build up. Yeah. Um, a few gray hairs along the way. 
Um, so I lean on, you know, whether it's LinkedIn, whether it's my, you know, network around Dallas, Fort Worth or Chicago, those are two areas that I'm pretty well networked in network with business school or past companies helps, um, you know, you know, the, the network is valuable. Um, some people take advantage of it and some people forget about it sometimes. Uh, right. so I do lean on it all the time, not just for people. I lean on networking for consultative advice too. When we're, when we're trying to figure out how to revamp, re, um, transform our digital business, I leaned out to my network from, you know, uh, you know, from Granger, from Lennox, from, you know, uh, Fleet Pride, from other companies, from business school classmates that have played in the digital transformation consulting stages. I got a whole bunch of free consulting from my network. Right. So business process ideas, take you know, new initiatives. I lean on that network for those kinds of things too. Um, and I'm coping that, you know, my leadership team is doing those kinds of things too. And so the more I can model that, I'm sure, you know, it, people are learning in our business. Um, but you're right. D different people have different styles. Some people are more introverted. Some people are more extroverted. Some people are used to not sharing information. Some people are used to sharing information. I mean, I guess as any leadership team, if we can model some of the, the values and the behaviors, so you know, the powered by people, the innovation, the integrity pieces that I talked about earlier. If we model those, it hopefully cascades down. I can't be at every staff meeting in the company. So I'm counting on my leaders that have staff to take the good information, put their own, you know, you know spins on it um, in terms of their region or their function, um, you know, and, and, you know, communicate across their teams. Um, we talk, I look for in my one-on-ones with my team, I'll look for examples for how they're doing it to understand, oh, that seems like it's working pretty well. Don't need to worry about, you know, uh, Bob or Sally or Sue. Um, or over here, I don't hear much information about the staff meetings and what's going on and what's being talked about and the accountability. Maybe I can mentor or guide that individual. I was in a conversation the other day about, um, titles in the business versus responsibilities. And I was sharing with the individual, I'm less worried about the title of a person. Uh, the person was worried that um, maybe um, they wouldn't be listened to because they have a different title than the other person they're trying to help and get information to, manager versus director. And I said, if you just show value, if we just build the responsibilities and the milestones, you're gonna wow the person, they're gonna come to you every time for the value you bring to the business, regardless of your title. And so we have to get away from the organization politics and hierarchy of some big companies. And I came from some of those big companies. I didn't realize how much organ how much energy I spent managing in organization politics to now in a smaller company, albeit my teammates sometimes think it's a big company, 130 people, but I think we have very little organization politics. And I hopefully I'm not blind to that. And I look for those that feedback in our surveys and our, you know, my skip meetings and, you know, meetings I have with, you know, folks when I hit the field uh, to, look, you know, learn what can we do different? What can we do better? Eric, what really comes through is your genuine excitement about this business. And it really sounds like you're having fun. That's so I have, I have, you're absolutely right. We're having a blast. Yeah, it's um, it's it's really apparent. So our, on this whole theme of of startup distribution company, um, what are some learnings that you could share with others who might be looking to launch a new distribution company? So let me reframe the question a little bit, Jonathan. Um, if you're a small company trying to make more impact and really grow, that's maybe where I can give more advice to it versus mm -hmm. a startup. Okay. I would, the advice I would give to smaller companies is think about building some, figure out how you can build scale so that you can invest more in the business and your customers. Okay. If you do the same thing over and over again, you're probably going to incrementally grow 3%, 3%, 5%, 5% kind of stuff. But if you really want to grow and make an impact on a region or an industry, think about how you scale up. In our case, we, we looked for outside investment dollars, like private equity funding. So you can figure out who can fund some of the investments so that you can really scale up. Once you have some scale, you can do the investments in the people, investments in the technology, investments in the processes. Um, I would also say, 
Try to build strategic relationships with your vendors, your manufacturers as a distributor. Um, and along the way, this journey, don't forget your entrepreneurial spirit. It's really important. And I don't know if I, um, you know, made enough emphasis on that earlier in the conversation is as we merge with, as we buy companies, we really want to keep their entrepreneurial spirit um, alive. And so I'm going to, so as you get bigger, don't lose sight of your entrepreneurial spirit out in the field. Um, focus first on your people and then keep trying to figure out what are your competitive advantages and what differentiates you versus your competition. That's never, that's not a one and done thing. Every year, every half year, you're, you should always be trying to figure out what do we, what can we do differently and better so that people can't just copy us. Right. We're already a step ahead of the competition. I don't know. Those are my few little tidbits on that question, Jonathan. Absolute, absolute platinum there. Thank you. Well, Eric, this has been, uh, it's been a fantastic conversation. Um, and uh, we're going to wrap up. I'm going to share Eric's uh, email address in a second. Um, but I did want to tell our audience about two upcoming programs we have on January 31st, uh, we're doing a program called Effective Warehouse Management in Challenging Times. That's at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific with John Schreibfetter and Matt Schreibfetter. Uh, it's based on a survey that they did uh, of our audience, along with you know just their long experience on how to improve warehouse management practices. So we hope you'll join us for that. Then on February 8th, we have a technology leaders panel called Leveraging Technology in a Tight Labor Market. So this will be uh, how to uh, leverage technology when you're having a hard time finding talent. Uh, that program is brought to you by Epicorn White Cup. Infor is going to bring the Effective Warehouse Management Program. Uh, so it's a familiar lineup of sponsors for us. We're really grateful for their support that makes these programs possible. Um, and then uh, Eric's email address is Eric, that's E R I C dot chernick c-h-e-r-n-i-k eric dot chernick at building dash controls dot com do we have that right eric you do yep okay um it's been a pleasure uh, oh it's been our pleasure it's just fantastic to talk to you uh, you're you're doing an amazing job there and uh I, i'm just not surprised i love the way that you lead and i always have so uh it's been a pleasure thank you for gracing us with your presence on our show we, we, look forward, we, look forward to hearing the, we look forward to hearing the next chapter in, in your amazing growth. There's a few more chapters coming. Stay tuned. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, and thanks for everyone who attended. And we'll see you on the next episode of Wholesale Change. Bye now.